Hello, everybody. My name is Susan Bontley, and I am one of the instructional librarians here at DACC. Today, we are going to have a workshop on supporting your research, how to find resources within the library to help you support your academic assignments. I'd like to do a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. First of all, I'd like to introduce Jose Aranda. He is another instructional librarian. He's at East Mesa campus. And today he will be my technical support. Also, the presentation will be recorded and both the slides, the handouts, and the recording will be posted to the library presentations webpage as soon as we can get it ready to go. Please make sure that your uh, microphone is muted so that you do not disturb or interrupt the presentation. If you have any uh, questions or any technical issues, go ahead and put them in the chat and Jose will do his best to either answer them or to help you out in some way. The links to the handouts and the guided notes are in the chat. If you don't see them, if you just arrived and they're not there, please go ahead and raise your hand and it'll get posted again into um, the chat. There are four of them. There is the guided notes. There is the keyword brainstorming chart, the power search tools, and um, how to find it general resources handout. Those are the ones that we are going to be using today. Guided notes, for some of you may or may not be familiar with uh, what guided notes are, and I'm just going to do a really quick overview. They are a tool that will help keep you focused on the presentation. It's really hard to sit and listen to something, or even if it's a little bit interactive, for a long period of time. And on Zoom, it's even harder. Guided notes are a way to help you catch the important points. They're sort of like a fill in the blank from my notes for the presentation. And so that way you will catch all the things that are of real importance. If you came through the ARC, could you please put your full name in your, the part that identifies you so that you can get credit for coming? Anyway, the guided notes are there to help you follow along on the presentation so that you're not constantly writing and trying to figure out, well, was that important or not important? That way, you'll be able to follow along and at the same time, uh, keep good notes. Okay, today's topic is support, effectively searching the DACC library databases, but I know that we have a couple people here from NMSU. And those databases that are in, at NMSU are also quite similar. They have a lot of the same vendors. In fact, some of the, a lot of the same databases. So what I'm gonna tell you today is completely applicable if you're using pretty much any major university um, database, even the ones at Brannigan Public Library, a lot of them are similar to what we have. So these are not just for DACC uh, library databases. But this presentation was set up specifically for DACC. Our objectives today are how to generate effective keywords and phrases, finding databases that are the best fit for your topic, how to improve your search results, and what to do with your results. If you look at the top of your um, guided notes, you'll see there are blanks in there to fill in these words. Now, you can always go back later on and view the presentation a second time and fill them in. But if you want to go ahead and write them in at the same time, that's fine. So let's start with the research process. We've talked about the four different handouts that we're going to be using. And the guided notes is highlighted to remind you that that's to help you with the presentation today as far as catching all the important things. The basic steps in the research process, we're gonna just go over this just briefly. We went over it in more detail last time. Last time we did steps one and two, which was identifying a topic and doing a sort of exploratory search for the information. It was held um, last week and I hope to get the presentation and all the notes and the slides up um, later on this afternoon. Today, we're gonna focus on step three, which is locating materials, your research resources. The next workshop we're gonna do is to evaluate 
these resources. And sometimes your resources don't come from databases. Sometimes they come from uh, books. Sometimes they come from the internet. I, I'm gonna give you some tools on how to effectively get credible and reliable resources that are academically oriented. Steps five, six, and seven, make notes, write your paper. And then citations, number seven, is how to do the two major citation formats, some plagiarism, how to do in-text citations, and how to do your resources section, you know, your page that either reference page or sources cited page. And we'll also talk about paraphrasing and summarizing. That will be on the 24th. And then your last step is to proofread. Today's focus, though, is on the four blocks on the left-hand side. We're going to generate keywords. We're going to choose databases. We're going to improve your results. And then we're going to talk about what the next steps are. What do you do with those results once you get them? Hopefully, you will join me and the rest of us next week when we do how to evaluate them. Make sure you've got the best academic resources that you can find for your paper. All right, so we're going to start with how to generate effective keywords and phrases. And one of the handouts I gave you was a brainstorming chart. So this is adapted from another library's web page. The idea is, is that you take your initial topic, your main topic, and first you put in similar terms, which are also synonyms. You go ahead and you talk about things that might be related. And you should have gotten some of these when you did your exploratory search that we talked about at the last workshop. Anything that might relate. In the case of this one, climate change is your topic, but global warming is another similar term. Greenhouse effect. And uh, these are all that you would probably have gathered when you've done your original research to make sure that your topic is manageable. Then you also might want to think in term, broader terms, expand it a little bit. Climate change affects the environment. Climate sensitivity, change and sensitivity are similar, but it's not exactly. Climatology, all of those are related, but broader terms. And then also, you should also think in narrower terms. If you are Focusing on an aspect of the large of the, your initial topic, like in this case, gas emissions or gases, polar ice melting. You put those in. And then there are related terms. Extreme weather is related to global warming and possibly um, climate change. Environmental health, sea level, all of those are related to, but not necessarily exactly your topic. So those are the way that you get a list of keywords that you can use when you go to the databases or if you're doing an internet search to help you find relevant sources for what you're doing, what you're researching for. Also, you should think about using whatever else you got from your exploratory search. You might have gotten names or dates or places. Those all might help narrow your search a little bit so you get relevant resources. Once you've got your list of keywords, the next step is to work with the databases. And we'll talk about which databases in just a minute, but right now this is, applies to any type of database. Using uh, academic databases is not like using Google. You can't just enter a question and get lots of responses. You have to have a, a very refined list of keywords in order to get useful information out of the databases. Eventually, I think they'll get more Google-like. Right now, it's pretty much you need to have like your main topic or maybe one of the narrower terms. The databases do provide you suggestions based upon what other people have searched and what they think you might be looking for. So that's very helpful. Uh, it's really trial and error, unfortunately. You try, and that's why your brainstorming chart might be useful for you to keep track of. Well, I got lots of hits when I put my main topic and this narrower topic or this broader term. I didn't get as many when I tried one, another term. 
And that way, that'll give you some ideas of what types of search and keywords and phrases that you use would be best when you go on to the next database, because you're going to be searching hopefully more than one database. That's the best way to get the most coverage and get the most relevant and credible resources. It's really about finding the right combination of words and phrases. You can use keywords, you can use phrases, or you can use a combination of both. Try it out and see what works. Abstract com, uh, concepts like freedom is an abstract concept. Even immigration can be pretty broad and abstract depending on what viewpoint you have. So the idea is, is that you're going to need to search within some of your results with additional terms to be able to give you more focused responses. You don't want 500,000, 20,000, even several thousand hits. You don't have the time to be searching through that. You would like to get eh, maybe 25, 50, 100 hits, but anything more than that, it becomes overwhelming and you probably need to bring it down a little bit. Abbreviations versus spelling it out, that all depends on you know, what the abbreviation means because abbreviation can mean a lot of different things. Like DNA is an abbreviation that you don't really need to spell out. But if you were using, let's say, DACA, you would probably use DACA and then the entire spelling of what DACA stands for because you might get different hits. It is best to use both of them. It's time to take a quick break since we've covered a lot of information. I want to ask you, what do you see here? We're going to take a minute or so. Do you see a woman here? Most of you probably saw that first. Or do you see two horses standing on their hind legs? The purpose for this you're asking is, why? Why in the world would we put this in the middle of a presentation? Some research has shown that uh, when you're receiving a lot of information, especially if it's new, it will help you sort of give your brain a chance to consolidate what you've just gotten so far. So this is a way for you to take a moment, take a break, look at something besides words on a page, maybe be able to take what you've already just learned and put it in your short-term memory for later so it'll eventually get into your long-term memory. Now we're gonna to get to the nitty gritty. Which databases are the best fit for your topic? Obviously the answer is, depends on your topic. And we have hundreds of databases. We have general academic databases and we have two major vendors, I forgot to say. One is Gale and one is EBSCO. And they each have different interfaces, but across their family of databases, all the Gale interfaces are pretty much the same. They look the same. If you move from database to database that belongs to Gale, everything's going to be in the same spot. You're going to be using the same commands in order for you to be able to use that database. Same with EBSCO. You only have to really learn these two major ones. We have a smattering of others, and so does NMSU, and a lot of it is about the same. I mean, if you do an advanced search in one, the fields are probably going to be quite similar across the different vendors and things like that, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about just the two that we have a majority of our databases from, the Gale and the EBSCO. Okay, so we have general academic uh, databases, and we have a lot of them. Uh, as you can see on your guided notes, we have academic search complete, academic one file and one file select. And those that say choose for D DACC students, if you are a DACC student, then you will use that particular link as opposed to for New Mexico residents. So if you're a New Mexico resident, the state of New Mexico gives you access to these databases as well, but it's a different portal. It's a different way to get in. So there, I gave you several there. We have newspaper, we have uh, books, uh, eBooks and things like that. 
There's a whole list there, and I'll show you a little bit more about how you can go about and get to them. We also have academic databases for argumentative papers or persuasive speeches and debates. And those things are a majority of a lot of the assignments that students come to us for is that I have to write in my English an argumentative paper. I have to take a stance on a particular uh, issue and I need to talk about the pros and cons. I need to argue or a persuasive speech or a debate. And we have three databases specifically geared for that type of an assignment. Believe it or not, they are also the same three databases that we talked about last week that we were using to explore topics. So if you've already used them, then you're ahead of the game. They are CQ Researcher, Opposing Viewpoints, and Points of View. So how do you find databases related to a specific topic? Well, on the library homepage, you can go to the second tab, which is this one right here that says databases, and you can click on see all databases. And that's going to open up another window. And you, the first search box that you've got above the list of all the databases that we have says all subjects. And if you click on it, there's a list of subjects and the number of databases that we have assigned to that subject. So if you are doing something, let's say in astronomy, as you can see on here, we have four databases we recommend for astronomy. That will help narrow down because we read over a hundred databases. And you don't want to be trying to figure out which database you should use. So this is the way to go about narrowing it down even before you start searching the database. Now, sometimes you find out that one vendor has several databases that are useful for you. And maybe you want to combine, maybe you want to look at a couple of academic databases and a couple of more topic-oriented databases. We've already set it up for you, a power search tool. And this is also a handout that I gave you that shows exactly how to do it step-by-step. Step. Since that handout has been created, we have set up as a actual database link, the power search for that. We have one for EBSCO, and we have one for Gale. You would, under your see all databases, you would just use the drop down box and go ahead and select EBSCO Power Search or Gale Power Search. And that will take you immediately to the Power Search page. Power Search allows you to enter in your search terms, your keywords, and your phrases and set up an advanced search and it will search multiple databases all at once. I'm going to stop sharing and show you a little bit. You can unselect or select various databases. So we went to the databases here. So I was going to select EBSCO. See, it's right here in capital letters. So I go like that and I hit go and you probably will hit a validation screen. And for the EBSCO power search, all of the databases are already selected for you. Because if I say show all, you will see this long list here of them. If you want to modify this list, and this is in the handout, how to select, you click choose databases and the whole list comes up. And you can select and unselect here as you need. Once you've done that, you hit okay. And you can start typing in your keywords and your phrases here. It's very simple, very easy, and it will save you a lot of time. So you don't have to be hopping to five and six databases. You can search three or four or more at one time. I would highly recommend that you don't search too many at once because you will probably get overwhelmed with duplication and a lot of resources. Maybe do a, a one or two academic databases maybe an academic and a newspaper, and then a couple of subject-related databases. And that should give you 
enough resources. If it doesn't, then add another database. If that still doesn't, then add another database. It's trial and error. With Gale, it's quite similar. Go down to Gale, Power Search. And again, they're all selected, but you can unselect what you need. I mean, if you're doing something that doesn't require the religion or maybe the war and terrorism, then unselect them. Why search them? It's going to cause you a lot more sifting to find what you need. So you would go through here and you could choose which ones you think are more useful to you. So we've done the power search tools. You get a lot of results. How do you improve them? You're starting to look through them and you're going, oh, I don't know whether or not that's going to help for me. This is in the How to Find It General Resources handout. And it talks about using limiters. And there are certain things that we highly recommend that you do in order to improve your search results right from the beginning. The first thing is always use full text. That's a little box that you can check on EBSCO. The Gale databases, they default to full text. And what that means is that you can read it right now. If you don't choose full text, you're going to get results that you're going to have to hunt down maybe in another database or maybe ask the library if they have a copy, those type of things. That's not necessary at this level of research. That's for PhDs and academic researchers really to use if they need to request something that the library doesn't have. So always use full text because then you can read it immediately. You can limit it by date. Depending on your topic, you may only be interested in information that was within the last few years. Remember last um, time I talked about the legalization of marijuana? and how something even three years ago might now be out of date. You might need to look at the most current. Our immigration policies have changed over the last five to six years. So those are things that could help you. A lot of times also your assignment might say something within the last five years. By limiting the date, you eliminate having to look at anything that is not within the range of the requirements of your assignment. You can also limit by source type. If you're told that you need academic, peer-reviewed, scholarly articles, then that is a button you can click um, that will allow you to only get those type of resources. You won't get any magazines or any newspapers or any non-academic periodical. That, that's one way to do it. So you can also search and only look at the academic resources and then do the exact same search and maybe only look at the magazines or the newspaper articles. These are ways to bring down your results so that you can quickly look through them and decide what's gonna work for you. I would recommend that you try it two ways. You can do it by relevance, which means that's how you can sort it. You can sort it as what is most closely related to the topic of the keywords and the key phrases that you put in your search. That's great. But sometimes, you know, it doesn't give you enough or it gives you things that are just a little off. If you do it by newest date, because the newest one may be at the very bottom or somewhere in the middle, you can see if some of the newer ones will work for you. Again, it's trial and error. And unfortunately, that is the research process. There is a question on what's a keyword versus what's a subject term. And sometimes there's even related topic. Now let's start with subject headings. Subject headings are fairly precise. A lot of databases have a set list of subject headings or terms that they use when they um, review the um, resources that they have and they assign it to them. When you look at an article, it will say subject term and it'll give them to you. And each of these are a hot link that you could find related to that particular topic or that subject. And it will save you time. 
it usually will help narrow it down a little bit. Keywords are a little bit more flexible. We usually start with keywords, but then once we find one or two articles that we feel are really good for our topic, then we need to look at the subject terms, the related subjects, and maybe the related topics associated with those resources. Maybe even the, um, the references at the very bottom of the article, if it has any, those could uh, be related to your topic and save you time by going and looking for those. Now we may not have all of them, but it's a, a step up than having to sift through 25, 30 or more of what you've got to make sure you find the ones that work. I can show you on a database. So I'm at EBSCO here and we've got all of them there, but that's okay. So I'm gonna do educational technology. And as you can see, here it is, it's giving me suggestions. I haven't even finished adding the words in there. And it's saying, oh, do you want instructional technology? Do you want it for K through 12? Do you want research and development? I'm gonna do ed tech uh, or technology in the classroom. It's going to give me probably a, a ton of resources because I didn't specify if I wanted higher ed, if I wanted you know just um, primary, elementary, secondary classes. And it's sorted by relevance. So you can click here and you can do newest or oldest. For EBSCO, your limiters are over here. Now, all of this is in the handout on how to find it. It shows you exactly where all the limiters are to do that. So I'm going to click on here just to show you, for example, where the subjects are and how it would help you. It has descriptors here. And each one of these we could click on and they're linked. This particular one only has descriptors. It's from Russia, so maybe it's not so much something that would be useful to me. But as you can see the highlighted in the abstract, this is where they're getting them from. So I'm gonna go back to the results list. And as you can see, I did not click on full text here. I, I don't have the full text here. Here I do, but here I don't. So if I click on full text, I dropped it down by over 100,000. That's 2017 here. Let's look at this one here. Again, descriptors. Sometimes they just have descriptors. Sometimes they have subject terms. Sometimes they have keywords attached to them. This is how you would get some of your extra keywords if you're having a hard time getting enough uh, results uh, for your assignment. You've done everything I've shown you so far, but you're running into problems. What do you do? Well, you can re reach out to your instructor, obviously. They will hopefully tell you, have you talked to the librarian yet? This is our contact information. We are open Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And you can reach us many different ways. If eight to five doesn't work for you because of your work schedule or your family life or whatever, um, send us an email and uh, we can set up a time that works for you. We can do video conference, uh, conferencing. We can do live chat. We can do it through email. We can also do it on, on the telephone. We recommend the video conferencing only because then we can demonstrate to you exactly what needs to be done. We can step you through exactly you need to do, but that might not work for you. This page right here is to our help page. It has got all of this information, our telephone numbers, how to chat with us, and that's live chat. And it's from eight to five. Someone will answer that as soon as they can, if not immediately. So all that information is there. And we, if you're having any trouble, can't find your resources, let us know. This is our job. This is how we help people. What do you do once you've gotten a few resources? The steps are you're searching, first of all. You're looking, using your keywords, your looking to see what is out there. 
you might have identified a few articles and you identify them by doing the power browsing. This whole thing for power browsing is to look at the abstract, look at the title, look at the keywords associated with it, and hopefully that will give you enough information for you to decide, is this something that might be useful for your topic? Or is it something that is too far away from what you're trying to do your assignment on? You should not be reading every single article as you go through. And this is the next thing, squirreling. But you know how squirrels, right before they hibernate, they go around and they gather all the, the nuts that they can. They stuff them in their cheeks and then they take them back to their home and then they put them away. Squirreling is identifying a good number of possibilities that will support your topic and then sending them to yourself, saving them, and then going back when you have time to sit down and really think and go through them, then you go through them. Squirrels always hoard more than they think that they're going to need. And that's the same thing with this. If your paper requires five resources, you should locate and save at least 10 to 12 of them because you'll be getting through and you say, oh, it's a great article. Oh, this looks good. And then as you get further and further along, you're like, oh, this is not what it, I thought it was. And you discard it. Well, if you only select five and you need five and you get rid of, let's say, two out of those five, now you have to start the process all over again. This is a way to save you time. So you search, you identify, then you save them. And on the how to find a general resources handout, it shows how you can save each reference resource that you find. And I can't stress this enough. It is highly recommended that you email yourself every single article that you find, even ones that you're not sure you will use, because it's really hard to go back and retrace your searching step days later when you realize, oh, that was a really good article. I should go back and get it. Now, I mean, you're going to be reading a lot. You might not remember exactly what the title was, you know, exactly what keywords you used or phrases to get to it. It's easy to delete an email. It's a lot harder to have to go back and spend the time retracing your steps. Cast your net wide, identify through power browsing, using the titles and the abstracts, things that you think might be useful. You save them and email them to yourself. And once you have them, they'll be offline. You don't need to be connected to the internet. You don't need to be online at all. Uh, you can read them at your leisure, and then you can just slowly go through the articles, get rid of the ones that don't relate so much, or maybe even prioritize. Maybe you're lucky, and out of the 10 that you sent yourself and you need five, you've got seven of them, okay? Then you start saying which ones are better for supporting um, what I'm writing about and which ones are okay, but you're better off having more than having to go back and recreate the support process, the search process. We are done sort of to leave you on a more peaceful uh, note. I know I covered an awful lot, but I'm hoping that using the guided notes and the handouts, you can go back. If you have any question about what we um, just covered, you can contact us. These are the sources I use. The guided notes handout is the one that you hopefully have been using the entire presentation. There were three other handouts, and then a lot of the stuff I uh, showed you came from these three websites. Just a quick recap. We went over creating effective keywords and phrases and using them either separately or together. We identified which databases are the best fit and how to do it for your topic how to improve your search results, and then what to do after uh, you have captured uh, your results. Next week at one o'clock is the third of um, our four uh, workshops. It's on how to evaluate any type of resource that you 
might use in your research activities. We will talk about how to choose credible and relevant resources. We have a couple of tools and strategies that will help you evaluate any type of resource. I hope that you will be able to come. You can either email me if you, that's how you got to the presentation, or if you went through the, the ARC Tutoring Center, then you would email them and get on um, their list. Okay. If you would please take a moment and fill out our survey, I'd appreciate it. Our YouTube videos have all of our presentations, any of the events that we have created, and then our presentations on webpage. We have over a dozen different presentations that we've been doing since the summer. Jose's done most of them, and there's some really interesting topics there. I really appreciate you coming. We hope to see you next week.